In this video series, we are pleased to introduce some of the writings of Dion Fortune to you. This video is about the third chapter, The Control of Environment, from the book Practical Occultism in Daily Life, in which Dion Fortune explains how we can control our emotions so that we are not unintentionally influenced by the influences of our environment. She also describes how we can release the karmic bonds to work out our karma. Brotherhood of the Eternal Light Teaching the Western Mysteries The Control of Environment As we saw in the previous chapter, the control of environment must begin with self-control, and until we cease to be influenced by surrounding conditions, we cannot hope to exercise any mental influence over them. Paradoxically, it is only when our environment ceases to matter to us that we have the power to change it by mental means. Having reached the point when we can obtain inner harmony, even if it be only for brief periods, we are in a position to undertake practical mental work. Let us then consider how to set about this all-important task. Meditation should always precede any action or decision, and the meditation should be, curiously enough, not upon the subject of the problem that is to be solved, but rather upon spiritual development and unfoldment upon selfless dedication to the highest ideal that can be conceived, and upon a clear and concrete formulation of that ideal itself. Then we should rise still higher in our aspiration, and meditate upon the limitless outpouring of spiritual life from which our individual lives take their rise, and should say over and over to ourselves as a mantra or litany the words, limitless power, absolute harmony, eternal duration, imagining the absolute as white radiance pouring down upon us and our environment as we do so. We should live our lives and do our work to the accompaniment of this refrain for days together, until we find that it is beginning to take hold of us and repeat itself as a tune does that runs in one's head. When this occurs and we find that the mantra is repeating itself automatically, we know that it has gone down into the subconscious mind and is reappearing on the surface again. Now we are in a position to do practical mental work because we have made subconscious contact with the infinite, and even before any mental work is planned or done, we shall be conscious of an inner change, a sense of wider life, of power and freedom. The effect of these rhythmic repetitions of significant phrases is very great, as Kui showed in his system of auto-suggestion, and as the Catholic Church has always known and taught in the repetition of prayers upon the beads of the rosary. As soon as this interchange begins to make itself felt, we are in a position to deal magically with our environment, but not before. It is not necessary that we should have achieved a condition of permanent equilibrium, for we can hardly expect this as long as we are in incarnation. But it does mean that we shall have moments of exaltation. When we have risen above our environment, it can say with St. Paul, none of these things move me. Diagnosis, however, must always precede treatment. And before we can decide what remedy is needed, we must classify the conditions with which we have to deal. This classification should always begin with our own subjective conditions, and we should ask ourselves what weaknesses in our nature have laid us open to the conditions of which we complain, and we shall find that lack of judgment, lack of endurance, lack of courage, lack of foresight, lack of energy, and many more of these little foxes that spoil the vines have been at the bottom of the trouble. Looking back over our lives, we shall see many things that we should have done otherwise if we had been wiser and stronger. At this stage of the process, we must never allow ourselves to lay the responsibility at the door of any other person or circumstance. If we have been wrongly dealt with by some person, we should not hold that person responsible and ourselves blameless, but should condemn ourselves for having been foolish enough to trust them or having lacked the courage to resist them. Having diagnosed our own weaknesses, our next task is to meditate upon the compensating qualities of those weaknesses. It is easy enough to find the opposite of the moral qualities that shall compensate any defect or overplus, but many people wonder how they can compensate for lack of wisdom or discernment. We shall find, however, that if we meditate upon humility, 
upon honesty with ourselves and the courageous facing of unpleasant facts, that wisdom and discernment will not be far to seek in the practical affairs of life. Our next task is to bring ourselves to accept the conditions in which we find ourselves as the result of our karma and to stop resenting them and feeling sorry for ourselves, for these conditions are the very things we need to teach us the lessons of spiritual development. Therefore, we should accept them as just and seek to learn what they have to teach us in the way of experience and spiritual development. This is an all-important step, and once we have achieved it and killed self-pity and resentment against fate, we have broken the karmic bonds that bind us to our conditions and are in a position to work off the karma by means of conscious mental actions, as the adepts do. But we can never hope to escape from a condition until we have broken by means of realization the karmic bond that binds us to that condition and fulfilled its lessons. That is why talismans made by any person except the one who uses them are valueless, and why the operations of ceremonial magic directed to mundane ends are apt to induce drastic reactions. The initiated adept, when he uses magical methods, diagnoses the karmic condition first and works accordingly. But the dabbler in occultism, and especially the unfortunate who purchases talismans and such like from the occult wholesaler who advertises their wares, is patching out effects and leaving causes untouched. And the cause is often at a spot remote from the effect, and sometimes responds in an unexpected manner when ignorantly tampered with. Anyone, however, who tries to work out his problems by reducing them to terms of spiritual first principles is on the right track, and has come into line with those forces which occultists call the Lords of Karma, so that these cooperate with him. And when this happens, problems clear up in a very surprising fashion. Each of the operations described above will take several days to do. They are not things which are accomplished one after another at a single sitting. Each should be persevered with until an inner change in response is felt, and then, and only then, should the next phase be embarked on. Having made our peace, as it were, with the Lords of Karma, we are now in a position to turn from within outwards and contemplate our environment. When we do this, we shall see that there are certain conditions which, unless we can alter them magically, must be accepted, for what cannot be cured must be endured and also certain other conditions which, by the exercise of courage, determination, and energy, are capable of modification. Let us consider first those conditions which we must accept as inevitable, save as they are capable of magical alteration, and leaving all magical considerations for the present, make up our minds to achieve such a degree of self-control and mind training that we are able completely to prevent any emotional reaction to them, for this is the essential preliminary to magical control. We must rise above irritation by meditation on compassion and serenity, above fear and nervousness by learning to control our imagination, for fear is entirely the product of the imagination. We do not feel fear of the thing from which we are actually suffering in the immediate present. And when we remember how much we have suffered from our fears of things that never happened, and how our severest suffering has often come from things we did not anticipate, and of which therefore we felt no fear, we shall see that although fear has its importance as a warning mechanism, it can readily overreach itself and be nothing but an intolerable nuisance, like any other bad habit and as such is to be overcome. We should therefore train the imagination not to dwell upon things we fear, but rather to picture a happy issue out of all our afflictions and ourselves as sailing triumphantly into the port of our desires. This happy daydreaming plays a far more important part in the lives of successful men and women than is generally realized. It is safe to say that no one who habitually indulges in timid and gloomy imaginings has ever achieved an ambitious goal. The person who habitually indulges in happy daydreams develops a peculiar mental atmosphere which is best described by the word glamorous, and the more sensitive of the persons with whom he comes in contact are influenced by it and see him not as he actually is, but as he pictures himself in his daydreams. 
It is thus that wildcat financiers raise money for their risky ventures, and crazy prophets collect disciples, and quack healers obtain the confidence of patients. There is a glamour about these visionaries which infects those with whom they come in contact, and as the belief of those about us induce self-confidence as surely as their distrust chills us, a circuit of action and reaction is set up which, like what is popularly called a vicious circle, increases in strength as it proceeds. It is a true saying that nothing succeeds like success. What modern psychology calls the language of unconscious gestures is an extraordinary eloquent thing, and is interpreted by the subconscious mind of others and reacted to in a way that neither they nor we realize in the very least. When our subconscious gestures announce that we expect a welcome, that we expect unquestioning acquiescence, nine people out of ten will respond and give us what we subconsciously signal that we are expecting. If our self-doubtings cause us to signal our diffidence, we are simply asking for trouble. If, on the other hand, our habitual daydreams have been concerned with our triumphant successes, we hang out unconscious banners of triumph, and 9 out of 10 persons will line up and march behind them unless our lack of wisdom is such that we have been chosen an impossible line of country. The mongrel that crawls up cringing is asking for the boot. But the boot is applied with discretion to the upstanding Alsatian. Violet Mary Firth, also known as Dion Fortune, was an important British cultist, ceremonial magician, and author. The Brotherhood of the Eternal Light is in direct lineage with the tradition of Dion Fortune, and recognizes her as a spiritual ancestor. We hope you enjoyed the video. If you have any questions, please feel free to write them in the comments. We will create a video to answer your questions after this video series. Would you be interested in us commenting on the writings of Dion Fortune and explaining in more detail her teachings in spiritual philosophy? If so, let us know in the comments. Visit our free online course on Western Mysteries and Kabbalah or our live events on these topics. And if you haven't already done so, please like this video and subscribe to the channel. See you soon in our next video.